Thanks, Paul. Okay, so you heard the medical side, and I'm going to talk a little about the surgery here. But before we start talking about surgery, um, we need to just talk about the fact that this is a very advanced topic. So I always want to preface those things so that the basic person doesn't start saying, oh, I did one male, I'm going to go and start doing women. It's much more complicated, surgically speaking, and also medically speaking. I'm not going to talk a lot about medical because you already heard that. It's the biggest thing I want to emphasize to you that's so devastating is potential shock loss after a procedure. And that's, you can see the lady, it's my patient on the left, where she just went almost crazy bald. And then this unusual donor area, which went com completely bald, women have a chance to lose a lot of their hair at a point where they may need, need to wear a wig. So preoperatively, the two things you want to understand is minoxidil. And when I was in um, uh, two meetings ago in Boston, I, I asked all these great guys, how, off, how long do you put these women on protective minoxidil? And the general answer was six weeks. I used to do like six months, but I still saw crazy shock loss. So um, education, education, education before procedure is so important. I always say the difference between an education and excuse is an education said before the procedure and his excuse is told after the fact, even though the same words. For the procedure to minimize shock loss, you decrease your epinephrine, about half the, the, the dosing, uh, decrease the towel clamps on the back in the, in the donor area, decrease your tumescence, and decrease really tight packing. Whatever you can do to minimize it, but afterwards there's still a, a high chance of shock. I usually put my patients still through about six months and nine months of minoxidil afterwards, if not ongoing, and you have to really warn them that they may need some kind of wig uh, outright possibly um, and also just potentially if it's not that bad some kind of camouflaging product like Topic, Dermatch, Nanogen, some kind of uh, camouflaging agent that would make it look like they're not as thin. Expectations, expectations, expectations are so critical. The key here is when you're looking you got to look at not only what you have to, to transplant but how thick is their hair because the number one thing is not just their density but it's how thick are the caliber of their hair. If their hairs are thin and wispy and fine and not curly, they're set up for a really poor result in general. No matter how much or lack of loss there is, you need to have enough good hair on the back. And you're gonna start seeing when we talk about the donor area, that that is something that um, is important to, uh, to look at. Indications are really two major indications that we talk about. One is just hair loss, and the other one is something called female hairline lowering, someone that was just born with a high hairline that wants to make it look more feminine. So first, we're gonna talk about um, how we're gonna harvest. Typically, this is just a, an area that we harvest for men going all the way across, but a lot of times for women, the, the sides near, the, near where the temples are are also thinned out. So sometimes you have to take a shorter strip. Because women wear their hair long generally, you can oftentimes not so focus on the scar per se, although obviously you really want to do good donor harvesting. So sometimes I go a little wider, like in men I tend not to go past a centimeter. For women, if they have enough laxity there, I may go up to 1.5, 1.8 centimeters and take a shorter harvest because I oftentimes can't take temple because there's just not enough uh, good usable uh, hair in that area. So the types of hair loss, you already saw this from Paul's lecture. This is a general Ludwig type pattern. It also comes in this Christmas tree pattern with the apex being toward the occiput. And then um, sort of this frontal temporal loss, sort of a male pattern loss that you see with women. Those are three types of losses. So in general, when you're looking at Ludwig loss, for example, how do you restore this? You have to strategize. You just can't stick hair everywhere. So when I'm looking at this, what I try to do is I look at where's the part and that helps me define where the maximal exposure is. So if they part over on the left, I'm going to hit the central forelock, the front, and I'm going to do that part on the left. And if they part on the other side, I'll do it on this other side, and they part in the middle. So you've got to pick your battles, and that's really important when you educate a woman that if they go, oh, I'm diffusely lost all over here, you may have a very unhappy patient when you try to scatter it to the winds. You've really got to concentrate. Concentrate for maximal effect and educate them that you're not going to cover everything, that you're going to target it on areas of maximal deficiency. And if you explain it, the fact that I've only got, let's say, 5,000 hairs to move, 2,000 grafts or whatever it is you have, that needs, it's not like I'm shortchanging you by covering a smaller area, I'm concentrating that work. And that's very important toward the education process. You heard before, another variation that I like to think about is this dumbbell idea, which is sometimes there's a little bit of a, of a widening uh, backside of the crown. Uh, in fact, this woman I just did uh, a couple weeks ago, I just took this photo, 
was more obsessed with her crown than anywhere else, and her crown was only exposed by this much. So what you're seeing on the left is, this is all uh, shooting from the back of the patient forward. I created this more central forelock, tapering along the part, uh, which was more on the right, and then a, a wider area around the crown, and I really focused on the crown. These are all di di follicular unit grafts. This, here's some examples of some work I've done. Just to understand that if you look at this, this is really concentrated. You just, and it's very tough. I had to put this everywhere. This, you couldn't really concentrate because it's just diffuse loss. And <clears throat> this is one session. And this, you can see, is more sort of that Christmas tree type pattern, if you will, or, you know, a more forward displays Ludwig's type loss. And this is just really focusing on the central forelock. And this is truly more like a Christmas tree pattern. And if you can't see the Christmas tree pattern, have them comb their hair in the middle and you can usually see it better. So then <clears throat> let's talk about female hairline lowering or female hairline restoration. In order to understand this, you gotta look at women's hairlines in nature. So you see this cowlick with this sort of central whorl going forward, and then you see these little mounds that come out to the sides, and then the, the closed angles. This is the opposite of the male uh, hairline in many respects. And this is, uh, these are all people that work with me. This is my nurse. You can sort of see a more profound central uh, widow's peak. And the way that she has her hair tied back, you can't see much of a cowlick. A little bit more of a square frame. So always challenge you, look at your neighbors, look at people that don't have hair losses. This is Amina's uh, shape is more of a long rectangle with a more prominent uh, widow's, uh, sorry, a more prominent uh, cowlick. And then these are patterns for men. You can see they've got those little, uh, little one hair floating islands of, of uh, sentinel hairs and you've got this sort of anterior position straightforward design. And then for women, it's, it's much more complicated. There's a central whirl you gotta create. We'll do that in the lab for those who are interested, but really remember, I encourage you, if you haven't done a single transplant, don't go to the female station because it's just too much. You, you're gonna have too much this weekend. Sort of, just like as much as I focus on, on what is lost in female hair loss, don't get lost by all the exciting stations you have. If you wanna spend a few minutes there, great, but if you don't get down a basic male hairline, don't start getting fancy. Uh, this is an advanced topic. It's very difficult to create beautiful uh, results. And you can sort of see that almost part of those hairs curl back. Those sites go backwards. You saw, I forgot who presented, maybe even Jim, about um, the, the hair angles going backwards on a man. That sometimes happens too. On women, often it's more common. So these are very bizarre angles going all over the place. And it's hard for your placers to place. And it's hard for you to design it if you don't, if you don't have experience doing a basic male hairline. This is just another variation with a little bit less backwards angulation. And then these are just some results uh, for the frontal uh, temporal area. Another one here. And then this one just more prominent. This was a two session procedure to get this result. Uh, we're gonna skip, do we have time? How much time did I go? When's the next talk? <laughs>